Thank you for your hospitality. I'm going to invite you to find your seats. Let's worship the Lord together. Heavenly Father, we are so glad to be in your house with you, in the presence of your Holy Spirit, in the presence of your people this morning. Already, our hearts are filled with joy and we are worshiping you for your goodness in our lives. So we ask, Lord, this morning that you would receive our, our praise and thanksgiving hear our prayers, opens our, open our hearts and our minds so that we can hear your word. That we would bless you and you would bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand with me and join me in the call to worship. Let's come into God's presence together. This morning, let's praise the Lord for faith he gives to live in his kingdom while it has not yet fully arrived. Faith is the conviction of things we hope for, the evidence of that which we have not yet seen. We live by faith in the Son of God, trusting God's faithfulness and his word, and not the appearance of passing circumstances. 
Faith is not always an easy choice to make. Faith calls for perseverance. eternal God, speak to each of us the word that we need, and let your word remain with us until it has worked in us your holy will. Cleanse, invigorate, and refresh our hearts. Direct and increase our faith. Grant that we, through our worship this morning, may be able to see you more clearly, to love you more fully, and to serve you more perfectly. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Let's pray together, shall we? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, uh, first thing we want to do as we come to you in prayer is turn our full attention to you, to look you fully in the face, to listen. to be present with you. So much of our time and our life and effort is spent in things that, uh, because we're limited, pulls our attention away from you. We're thinking about other things, we're doing other things, we're caring for other people. And this morning, while all those things are true and they continue, we want to focus our minds, our hearts on you and remember that you are always with us, that you are always faithful, that you are always good, that in every struggle in our lives you bring strength, healing, you open doors of opportunity to the future that we, we did not expect, and sometimes we even gave up anticipating. So help us to come back into your presence so that all those things that we know in our minds that we forget about through the week would, would find their home, their rest within our soul. And we'd find ourselves renewed in the assurance of your great love. Heavenly Father, I want to pray this morning um, for Andrew and Amy Funka who serve you in, in Prague in the Czech Republic. We saw this morning uh, information about their ongoing ministry. These nine uh, teen girls that were uh, in a camp with them this week, uh, other kids that are going to be with them in camp next week, and they're going to be uh, teaching English and using that, uh, that desire to learn English on the part of teens uh, as an opportunity to share not only a language but you. And so, Lord, we ask that you would, you would send your spirit upon that ministry, that you would build relationships so that uh, the, the students, the campers, would, would see that not only Andrew and Amy, but the other uh, leadership is there because they care, uh, that they'd find that their English skills are growing, but more than that, Lord, that you'd plant seeds in their hearts and they'd that you would bring them to yourself. We are grateful that they're an extension of the ministry that we share together. We ask, Lord, that your spirit would empower that work that you have given to them, even as you empower us as we work together. Help us to be faithful in our community, uh, to live for Jesus Christ, not just as individuals, but as a, as a, as a church, as a community, and Lord, we pray together for the, uh, the carnival that's coming up this Tuesday. Uh, we hope that many people will come beyond that, Lord. We pray for opportunities to connect with those people so that we can build relationships that allow us to share Christ. And we know that a lot of folks that are going to come are going to believers. They attend other churches, but some are not and don't attend. And we want to take this opportunity to extend your grace and love to them. And Lord, we ask that your spirit would be at work in them and in us ahead of time and that there would be great fruit. Lord, we need volunteers. We need people who are willing to uh, simply be there uh, to introduce themselves as members of this church and, 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 and welcome those who come. Place that serving spirit upon us, we pray. 
Lord, we pray for these we've uh, named before you. We want to lift Ron and Dawn before you. Um, Lord, we're grateful that uh, Rebecca uh, recovered so well, and we pray for her and her mom as they, as they travel to Iowa. Another fam family is traveling. We ask that you'd keep them safe. We pray for Trudy, uh, for Ed, for Logan, and ask that your healing would, would be with them. And Lord, we, uh, we give you thanks that uh, Katie's surgery went well, that she's recovering. We pray for complete success as she heals. We pray, Lord, your blessing upon her children, her husband, her whole family. We lift before you uh, Tyler and Giovanni who are uh, receiving the soldier boxes. We ask that you bless them and the men and women uh, who serve with them, and that you'd watch over them and their family until uh, the time when they're able to come home and be reunited. There are probably things on our minds and hearts, Lord, for each of us, big or small. We lift them to you because we know that you are the God of all good blessings. And we pray, Lord, that you would provide and that you would guide us to do the things that you would call us to do. Grant us wisdom to face the circumstances of life that are beyond our, uh, beyond our wisdom. Strength and courage to do the things that you would call us to do. Joy in your presence and in the service of your gospel. Thank you, Father, for hearing us. We worship you. We bless you. Together, we pray these things in Jesus' name as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Heavenly Father, we ask that you heal the hearts and lives of those victims of the El Paso and Dayton tragedies. As Christians, we are our brother's keeper. Be with us as we accept the challenge. Please accept these, our tithes, our offerings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. This morning I'm going to invite you to open to two passages from the scripture. Uh, first is from the very last chapter of Genesis, chapter 50, uh, beginning at the 22nd verse. We're going to read this from page um, 85 in the front of the Bible. And when you have found Genesis chapter 50, then turn toward the end of the Bible to Hebrews chapter 11. This passage is found on page 1,874. We're going to read verses 1 through 16 and then verse 22. Let's give our attention to God's word. First from Genesis. Joseph stayed in Egypt along with all of his father's family. He lived 110 years and saw the third generation of Ephraim's children. Also, the children of Makar, son of Manasseh, were placed at birth on Joseph's knees. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Joseph made the sons of Israel swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up from this place. So Joseph died at the age of 110, 
And after they embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, he still speaks even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death he could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he con condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he, had not, uh, he, would, not la he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking for a city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age, and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they'd been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were looking for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God for he prepared a city for them. In verse 22, by faith, Abraham, when his end was near, spoke, not Abraham, by faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions about his bones. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this book because it is your word. We're thankful for the things that it speaks to us. We're thankful that over a lifetime it nourishes our souls. And there are mysteries here, things that we struggle to uh, not just to understand but to bring into our lives. So nourish us again this morning from your word so that we find strength and peace and comfort in your goodness, power to serve your kingdom. Perseverance. Help us to carry on in Jesus' name. Amen. This is uh, the passage that we started uh, last week with. I want, I want you to see it again. I want, would you read it with me? 
Let's read this together. <clears throat> Even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. Last week we saw God's faithfulness to his people throughout uh, every stage of life. This passage says, even to your old age uh, and uh, gray hairs, but if we were to back up to, to the verse just before, it talks about from conception and birth, even to. So it, it, Isaiah is talking about the whole sweep of our lifetime, and there's, there's never a time when you as one of God's children uh, pass out of his care and his attention and his love for you, even to our old age. Gray hair. He is the one that sustains us. Every stage of life has its own challenges. That's true, uh, certainly, of when we get older. And that, that means that it is not enough simply to start well. It means that it's also necessary for us to, uh, to finish well. Uh, Longfellow wrote, uh, great is the art of beginning, but greater is the art of ending. And uh, Billy Sunday, who was an evangelist in the early part of the 20th century, uh, said, stopping at third base adds no more to the score than striking out. It doesn't matter how well you start, if you do not finish. Isn't that true? Um, and so we want to look at this promise because here is God's word to us as, as we may be getting closer to the finish line, reminding us that he's faithful. And so in his faithfulness, we can continue to be faithful at every point in our life. Um, somebody might ask, well, how do you... How do you live by faith to the end? And Hebrews that we just read gives us this, this, great, uh, this great cloud of witnesses who testify to us that all of the struggles of life are worth it. And all the challenges to our faith can be met by faith in Jesus Christ. That's really what the author of Hebrews is trying to say. So and so, by faith, did this and that. And another one, by faith, did this and that. And he says to us, and did you hear those words? All these people were living by faith and they died. And he means by that, the thing that had been promised to them, they had not yet held in their hands. But they hung on by faith. And uh, Joseph is one of the great examples. That's why we wanted to read on to find uh, that uh, verse 22 in Hebrews 11. He's one of the great examples. Uh, by faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. Isn't that a weird <laughs> verse? <laughs> he, it's, it's one thing to talk about the Exodus. It's another thing, now, when I die, this is what I want you to do with my bones. We need to take a minute to think about um, the faith that that passage is talking about, the faith uh, that Joseph and these other witnesses show to us. And Hebrews 11 gives us some important things to, uh, to think about in regard to faith. Uh, Hebrews 11 uh, verse 1 says, says these important things. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and being certain of what we do not see. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and being certain of what we do not see. There are two things 
that that passage emphasizes for us about the, about the character of faith. Um, first thing is that faith is certainty. It's being sure. It's, it's, it's this attitude of holding on, isn't it? Well, that's not surprising. But the other thing that it says is that faith is, is certainty of what we don't possess. See, that's the challenge. Certainty of the thing that we don't hold in our hand. Why is that important? Uh, because Hebrews describes the experience of faith for us. Um, faith is future oriented. Faith is anticipatory. If we're going to live by faith, we are going to wait. Because then that's the nature of faith. Paul says you do not hope for the thing that you already have, do you? You've got it. You don't have to hope for it. You may be happy about it. You may be rejoicing, but you're no longer hoping because you possess. Faith means we don't have it yet. Even though we are certain of it, we don't have it yet. So we're looking to the future. We're waiting. Faith is about waiting. And that means that there are going to be struggles within our soul between what God has said he's going to do and what we can see. And that's the importance of hearing the nature of faith. It is this tension between what God said, what I can see, what God has promised, and what I'm holding in my hand. Christians live in that tension. If we know that already, uh, we can anticipate the times when our faith is going to be uh, strong. We're going to feel uh, like we're, we're filled with faith and we're going, to, we're going to be able to look into the future and say, right now, I, I'm uncertain, I believe it. And we're also going to be prepared for the times when our faith begins to kind of melt within our heart. And try as we will, we look into the future and we, we really can't see much. And, and we're worried about it. And if we know that there are those two sides of the experience, then we can hang on not to how we feel. Because our feelings are going to come and go. We, instead, we can hang on to the thing that God has promised, knowing that faith isn't holding. It's anticipating what God has already promised. So again, we hear these words from Hebrews. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. You remember the story. At the end of uh, Joseph's life, um, after he had fed his family through the famine, uh, eventually the whole family, 140 people, moved to Egypt and were welcomed by the Pharaoh and they were given their own uh, section to live in and time passed and Jacob died and now Joseph is near the end of his life. And he's been in Egypt, he lived 110 years, uh, we, we first hear about him when he's 17, so some 90 years or so he lived in Egypt. And after those 90 years, he says to his people, look, you're not supposed to stay here. I don't know how long you're going to be here, but this is one thing I do know. God promised to our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, a promised land. And that means God's going to come and he's going to lead you out of this land. When, I don't know. How, I don't know, but I know what's coming. Now here's the personal thing. He says that to the people around him. And then he says, here's what you're going to do. When I die, well, I have uh, this grave 
uh, site already purchased and I have a pre-plan agreement with this, uh, this embalmer and I want you to know that um, every, all the life insurance policies are in this folder in my desk and, right, you know what he said? No, what he said was, embalm me and take my bones home with you. So the end of the book of Exodus ends with these strange words. After he was embalmed, they put his body in a coffin in Egypt. It doesn't say they buried him. No interment. What did they do with that coffin? Was it sitting in the backyard on a wagon waiting ready to go? He was looking forward to something more. Even though his life was going to end, he knew that was not the end of what God was doing. He believed that um, because of the promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We've got to go back earlier in the book of Genesis. What a great book. It's hard sometimes to read, especially through all those genealogies, but what a great book. And it comes in uh, Genesis chapter 12. That's when, we, that's when we really begin to meet Abraham. And chapter 12 contains the elements of what we call the Abrahamic covenant, the promise that God made to Abraham that really begins the whole role of faith. And he said these things. He said... There we go. He said, first to Abraham, I will bless you. That's the first part of the covenant. Then he says, I'm going to make your descendants a great nation. Remember the, 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 the passage that says that uh, uh, we read earlier that uh, even though Abraham was sold and Sarah was past uh, having children, he, he raised up from those two people uh, descendants so numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the, on the seashore. That was the promise that God made to Abraham. If you, he took him out into the, into the night sky and said, look up there and see all the stars. Remember, they didn't have street lights, so you could see an awful lot of stars. And if you can count those, well, you won't even be getting close to the number of descendants you will have. I will make from you, your descendants, a great nation. I will give them a land. And he took him to the land, and when he got to the land, he said, this is the land. This is it. And finally he says, through you I will bless the whole world. That, that anticipates the coming of Messiah that out of one man comes a nation, that they enter this promise, and eventually through these people comes the Savior of the world. That's the Abrahamic covenant. And that's what Joseph heard. Abraham was his great-grandfather. So Abraham heard this covenant, and, and he lived his life in anticipation of it. And finally, when Isaac was born, there's the son of promise. There's the beginning of the descendants so great you won't be able to count them. And Abraham said to Isaac, he had to, it's not in the Bible, but he had to say this, Isaac, you're the one. Do you know how special you are? Do you know what God is doing with us? Do you know what's going to happen from you? Isaac learned the covenant. Isaac's son was Jacob. Isaac said the same thing to Jacob. Do you know the story? Jacob had 12 sons. Joseph is the 11th. And there were a lot of evenings around the dinner table when Joseph made sure that those 12 sons heard the covenant. This is God's promise to us because we are Abraham's descendants. I will bless you. I will make you a great nation. I will give you this land. We're living here in tents right now, but someday this is our land. And I will bless the world through you. You know the rest of Joseph's story? Uh, that, this is the foundation of his faith. This is why he said to the people, 
box up my bones and carry me home. Because I'm in Egypt, and I've been a great man in Egypt, but this is not where I belong. This is not my home. Take me with you when you go. Certainly God will aid you. Take me when you go. But he didn't get to that place easily, did he? Uh, when Joseph was young, 17 or so, he was a little bit arrogant. That surprises us, doesn't it? About a 17-year-old. Uh, and so as he made his brothers so mad that they, literally, they decided they were going to kill him. Now, this is a dysfunctional family. They decided they're going to kill him. But instead, they sell him into slavery. And the Ishmaelites who buy him take him to Egypt and sell him to a, a captain of Pharaoh's guards, a man named Potiphar. He's late teens, early 20s at the oldest when he ends up in Egypt. Can you imagine how he must have felt at that point in his life? Your brothers betrayed you and made you a slave. They didn't just beat you up. And now you're in this foreign place and you are owned lock, stock, and barrel by this guy Potiphar. That would be a great time to abandon your faith, wouldn't it? I mean, you have all the reason in the world to say that promise that God made to my great-grandfather must not apply to me. Because how on earth is any of this going to happen? How is God going to do this where I am? He ends up in prison. Great place to give up on your faith. Because you see, none of the stuff that God says he's going to do looks like it's ever going to happen. And in that, when we hit those moments, that's when, we, that's when we give up because what we do is we forget that faith is the evidence of things you can't see. And the things that we can see are we're in, in prison, we're, we're a slave, our family betrayed us, that's the stuff we see and therefore we believe that's the reality. But faith is being sure what you can't see. Being sure of what God said he's going to do. Joseph's story doesn't end there either. And you, you know the rest of the story. Uh, Pharaoh has a dream. Uh, they go to Joseph in prison because he has the reputation of being able to interpret dreams. They bring him out. He interprets the dream. He talks about the years of abundance and the years of famine. And Pharaoh makes him second in command. And most of the time when we read, read that, we say, Yay! God... Uh, came through, right? I want you to know that Joseph is in just as much danger of losing his faith when he is a prime minister as he is when he's in prison. Because now, after God abandoned him, was it God that brought him there? Was it Pharaoh? He had years of prosperity and success is just as dangerous as failure because it makes us comfortable it makes us forgetful it makes us start to think that well, I got it made so do I really need God both sides of human experience every part of human life has its temptations. And when Joseph became prime minister, he was not freed from the temptations to abandon his faith. When you and I experience failure, we have an opportunity to abandon our faith. When we experience success, we have a different kind of opportunity to abandon our faith it is just as real. What is it that kept Joseph with his feet on the ground? It was this covenant. He believed that God said it. And he believed that even though he couldn't see it, God was going to do it because faith is the evidence of the thing you cannot see.
He wasn't superhuman. Uh, it wasn't like he never felt pain, that he didn't feel uh, angry, hatred toward his brothers. It wasn't that he never felt abandoned. It wasn't that he never questioned what was going on. All those things happened in Joseph's mind and heart. I guarantee it. Not because I know him, but because I know humanity. And there isn't a human being that doesn't experience those kind of things in the face of struggle. There isn't a human being that doesn't uh, experience the temptation of just kind of ignoring God more and more when the sailing is smooth. But he held on to the covenant because he understood that faith isn't holding, faith is anticipating. Faith is the evidence of the stuff we don't have yet. And that's why it works to the end of life, because for, at every stage of life, we're anticipating something. I, I wonder if you, if you have that same kind of, of uh, vital anticipation, so that at this point in, in your life, you'd say something like, when God comes to your aid, box up my bones and take them with you. I, I just know that God is going to do something. And I want to be in on it. I'm, I'm planning for God to do something. And I want to be there when he does. Even when I'm dead, I'm going to be in on it. Is that, is that where your faith is? See, that's the kind of faith that, that you can have when you believe that even to my old age and gray hair, he's the one. He made me, he carries me, he sustains me, he's going to rescue me. I want to suggest a couple things that um, we can do to participate in that. Uh, first of all, you've got to ask what you're believing for. Joseph knew what he was anticipating. Christians need to know what we're holding on to by faith. We're holding on to forgiveness of sin and reconciliation to the Father. That, that's essential at every stage of life. No matter where you are, that's, that's rock bottom. We are anticipating power over sin, so that sin no longer is our boss. It may not be perfect, but we're growing closer to, to the likeness of Christ. We are holding on to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. More power to live for Christ. And we are holding on to life after death. Death is going to come. It might happen quickly. It might be gradual. We might feel perfectly healthy and wake up the next day and find ourselves in heaven. Or we might go through a long period of illness. Doesn't matter, one way or the other. but we are looking forward to life. So that's what we're holding on to. Now we've got to ask what stands in our way of those kind of things. Trials and suffering can stand in your way. Grief, illness, loss, a, a sense of frustration with life that it isn't going the way you want it to do, all those things can undermine your faith. So can success and comfort. Because we just, we are enough in ourselves. We have what we need. So I don't need anything from God. Those are the things that can get in our way. How do we face them? We embrace the truth that we heard in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 1. Faith is being sure of what you hope for. We just know that's what it is. Faith is assurance. Faith is waiting. And we need grace to do both of those. So we hold on to Jesus Christ. It always comes back to holding on to Jesus Christ. Uh, you probably have heard this uh, 
this old story about Winston Churchill, but I think it's worth telling. Um, did you know that Winston Churchill took three years to get through the eighth grade? Uh, because he had trouble with English. Imagine that. Churchill has trouble with English. Well, he did. He turned out okay, I guess. Uh, years later, Oxford University asked him to address, uh, uh, make an address at commencement exercises, and he arrived with his usual props, a cigar, a cane, and a top hat. The crowd rose in appreciative applause, and he, he stood before them and settled the crowd and uh, removed his cigar, put his top hat on the podium, and then he just stood there, gazing at the audience. And finally, he said, never give up. Silence. Silence. He said it again, never give up. Looked at the people on the other side, never give up. He picked up his hat and his cigar and walked off the podium, and that was his commencement address. Faith is the certainty of things we have not yet received. So don't give up. God isn't done yet. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we need the nurture of your Holy Spirit because we're not good at waiting. We feel the pain of failure the emptiness of grief. We come to the end of our resources and we feel hopeless. So grant us your grace to be people of faith, filled with assurance even while we wait. Amen.
His grace, His peace, His power, His faithfulness. Amen.